sleepy as you look this morning, I was considering having you remain standing for the sermon. I don't know. I don't know how this group of young people over here has done so well during the summer, but I think it's great. Right through the summer, we've had this good crew of senior highs. How many of you are going to camp tomorrow? Way up. Let me see your hand. Oh, boy, that's great. There's something to pray for all week. They're going to leave tomorrow morning, going to be at camp. And uh, you're going to be back for church next Sunday here, are you? Right? They'll be all alert and everything. Won't be tired. They'll be worn out next week. You can count on it. You do look sleepy this morning, though. I don't know what's wrong with that. I was in the airport a few weeks ago, and I sat down at the places where um, I had to kill a little time. I was taking one of my daughters-in-law to the airport, and uh, all the tables were full, so we sat down at the table with two nice-looking people. It turned out they were, they were anesthesiologists, and I <laughs> I said, I'm in, sort of in a mass anesthesiology myself. <laughs> And one of them looked at me as though I were kind of crazy. He says, oh, well, are you a teacher? And I said, no, I'm a minister. <laughs> I said, it's bad enough when the people go to sleep. And I said, once in a while I catch myself waking up. And that's really bad. <laughs> but on these summer days, sometimes really it's, it's almost comical to look across your faces here and uh, wonder what in the world you've been doing on Saturday night. But at least you're here this morning. And I know you're here to worship the Lord, too. If a song is worth singing twice, a sermon is worth preaching twice, and this evening, the Lord willing, I don't know when a series has had more positive response than last winter's series on the book of James. And uh, this evening, I want to look at the keystone message in that series on uh, the power of prayer from the book of James. So we'll be re-preaching that. Well, it won't be the same sermon either. It didn't come out the same way when I, I prepared it thoroughly. This morning, not the sermon that you have in your bulletin, but it's not an old sermon either, just some, some fresh thoughts that came to me from the 84th Psalm. Psalm 84, if you could turn with me. The theme this morning in my mind as I preach is being at home in God's house. At home in God and at home in God's house. How lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed, how happy are those who dwell in thy house. They are ever praising thee. How blessed, how happy is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace to and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed, how happy is the man 
who trust in thee. Father, open our hearts, we pray, to the music that this poet heard when he first wrote these words. By the Holy Spirit, open our hearts and teach us how to be at home in you and how to make you at home in our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist makes an interesting and perhaps a provocative statement, a comparison in verse 10. It might be taken for sour grapes if the psalmist had had royal opportunity and access to both options. But he says, a day in the courts of the house of God is better than a thousand days lived anywhere outside. And then he said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to be the sheik of Araby and not know him, to dwell in the tents of wickedness. How many times we quote this little verse when somebody opens the door of the church to let somebody else in, a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, and yet this little verse carries so very much. He compares the best of life without the knowledge of God with the very lowest rung of real spiritual life, and he declares, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than the rich, opulently appointed person who dwells in the tents of wickedness. He compares God's life with natural life at its best. He compares time-wise. He says, one day lived for the Lord is better than a thousand days, and that's a pretty good ratio. One day that's really lived in God's house, at home in God, is better than a thousand days doing anything else you could think about but outside of spiritual reality. Quality time spent living in God's presence is satisfying beyond all comparison. This doesn't make sense to the world. And yet, if you know God in any measure, you understand a little bit of what the psalmist is saying here. In John Wesley's journal, there is one interesting note. One place he says, today, I live a day. He had felt at the close of that day that God had used him, that he had been doing things that were significant. He had been in God and God had been in him and he wrote in his journal, today I lived a day. And I wonder, have we ever really lived a day? In all honesty, each of us has to admit that there are many days when we have put in our time and haven't had any real sense of accomplishment. In fisherman's language, we say to the master, Lord, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. And I, I know that feeling very well, literally and figuratively. And yet I wonder, is there a way we can increase the ratio of days really lived to days that are just on the clock, putting in our time? The nature of life being what it is, it's impossible that we have every day be an adventure, every day be something that will titillate us emotionally and make us feel that this was the greatest day we've ever lived. And yet, is there a way that we can increase the ratio of coming to our rest at night and saying, by the grace of God, by the help of God, today 
I have lived in God's family, in God's house, and have the satisfaction of knowing that we have walked the day with him. Is it possible to increase that ratio? I think very often we're not just aware of the fact that we have been walking. We need to, to pause and thank the Lord that we've been able to walk with him. But the ratio, even time-wise, is here. One day that we really live with God is better than a thousand. And then also, he compares by way of job descriptions. And he concludes that faith life at any level is better than simple, selfish life, even opulent evil. I wonder, is this really valid? Is it better to be without indoor facilities and uh, living from hand to mouth and really hard up against it and still being serving the Lord or, or living in the penthouse? Is the fellow that really is hard up against it but loves God, is he really better off than the person who has the things of this? We are so oriented to think in terms of things. We are in danger of adopting uh, yuppie values in our whole society. You say, what are yuppie values? Well, yuppie values are those that make things the goal and end of life. My, one of my daughters-in-law works for a venture capital firm. And she has access to resumes of people that are applying for exciting loans, for things that put, they put venture capital into. And she, they have to list all of their, all of their uh, assets, totally. And she says Cadillacs are passe anymore. That's not impressive at all. You have to have a silver shadow or a Jaguar before anybody looks at your resume and says, well, this person's made it. What's a silver shadow, by the way? It's a, it's a Mercedes that goes for a hundred and some thousand dollars. And I think of how my father-in-law built a brand new house for eight thousand dollars. Makes me sick when I look at the car prices today. But valuing things and making things the goal and end of life are counter to God's value. God's values, on the other hand, do not say, they do not say that material things are nothing. God never says that things are not important. God never says it's a sin to have things or to use things. But God would remind us that we use things and we love persons. God would remind us that things are tools by which we either serve God and serve mankind or else they are that by which we become enslaved and in fact become idol worshippers. So it's not a case of settling for being a doorkeeper. It's a comparative statement. I'd rather be a doorkeeper and be where God wants me to be than to be a venture capitalist and have a silver shadow, have all the things that this world, if I ever come close to envious when I'm out there in conference and I see one of those big yachts go by, I could have a yacht and have a lot of fun with it, I think. I think, of course, if somebody gave it to me, I'd go broke just putting gas in it. So I'm happy the way I am. But the idea, God doesn't want us to get hung up on things. But he wants to make sure things are what we use to glorify him and things are not the end and goal and purpose of our lives because things cannot satisfy. Is there a way in which we may be saved from being sucked into yuppie values, saved from modern idols, and be sure that we have things in their proper perspective and place? I say the answer is yes to both of these questions. We can increase the ratio of days really lived to days that are just put in. We can have God's perspective on things so that we can use things 
and love people? And the answer is, here in this psalm, those who are at home in God. Life is secure, values are on straight, things are in a proper place, time is invested wisely only when we dwell in God, when we abide in God's house. Here in this 84th Psalm, I hear resonance with the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, where Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. There's strength, verse 5, how blessed, how happy is the man whose strength is in thee. There's the promise of good things, verse 11, no good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. I steer away, I, I lean over the other direction to keep from preaching a gospel of prosperity. And yet the, there's a kernel of truth there that when we get our values on straight and, and put God first, he delights to prosper us. He delights to give us good things. Yet when we turn around and seek the things first, somehow they become the will of the wisp, the phantom that always eludes us. But when we seek to put God first and to dwell in his house, then it's his delight to satisfy us with good things. But you know, this abiding involves what the psalmist calls highways in the heart. Look at verse 5. Did you ever see that phrase before? How blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Highways in the heart. What does that mean? How can you have highways in your heart? In whose heart are the highways to Zion? It could mean always thinking about how and where and when we're going to meet with God next. The Jews always had a, a saying, I, I still think the Jews that haven't been to the Holy Land still say it. When they celebrate the Passover, they say next year in Jerusalem. Our guide over the Holy Land told about a fellow that, at the Wailing Wall who was, it looked like he was doing the habit of it. And so he was saying, Lord, next year in Jerusalem. And, and one of his fellow countrymen tapped him on the shoulder and said, you're here, you're in Jerusalem. He says, no, he says, I mean, it. no, next year, he says, with my people. And he was saying, I mean Miami Beach next year. <laughs> The Jew told me that, and I, I, I butchered that. I butchered the, uh, the punchline on it, but you get the idea. But there's the highway in the heart, either to the Holy Land or, or to Miami Beach. Maybe that's an idea. But I think also highways in the heart could mean how can I make ways for God to come into my life? Isaiah said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Highways are arteries. They're ways of communicating life. John said, or Jesus said in John 15, I'm the true vine. You're the branches. Branches aren't just stuck on the vine, but there are capillaries. Prof Babcock can tell you a whole lot more about it than I. One day I was preaching on this, and he said, you know where they meet? Of course, I didn't know where they met. He said, they meet down in the root. The life is shared by the vine and by the branches. The highways in the heart are a relationship. Sharing life with God at home in Him means opening the avenues in every area of our life and saying, Lord, you're welcome to come in here. You're welcome to come in here. Come into my office if I am a venture capitalist. Come in and make sure that you're at home here. If I am a doorkeeper, you're welcome where I live in my relationship. Another way of saying we're at home with God is to make him at home in me. And salvation and security and love and righteousness are all, relapsed, are all wrapped up in this relationship. Not just doctrines and experiences and formula, but God at home in me. And these highways of the heart, have I opened my heart in the areas 
of my life? Is God at home in my thought life? My casual reflections. What I think about when the meter's turned off reveal the real me. And in my thought life, am I critical? Am I comparing? Am I envious? Am I negative? Am I listening to gossip? And am I lustful? Or am I seeking God's mind? Am I making highways for God into my thought life? Asking God to help me to seek the best construction on others' faults. Seeking God's mind. God at home in my thinking. And then God at home in my body. In my material world. The world of things. The world of action. Do my appetites reflect the glory of God? Are my spoken words conducive to making him comfortable in me? My standards of conduct the way that I spend my leisure time, how I dress. You say you're preaching legalism this morning. I'm not. I'm certainly not. And yet, highways in the heart, highways of holiness, I want to be compatible so that God can walk with me in every attitude and avenue of my life. Is God at home in my home? The way that I live together with the other people that I love. Is God acknowledged as one in the company of those with whom my soul takes fellowship? It's one thing to be Christian nominally and to attend public worship. It's another thing to determine that where I live, God is going to be a very real partner in the relationships that take place there. Do we recognize that God is the source of all good and source of all blessing? And does it come natural for us to praise him to other Christians? And sometimes when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to even praise him to people who are not Christian. Avenues, highways of the heart you see a sunset when you hear something beautiful to say praise God from whom all blessings flow praise him all creatures here below in whose heart are the highways to Zion that is where God is at home as we are at home in God and make God at home in us we come to see the truth of verse 11 no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed, how happy is the man who trusts in thee. We can increase the ratio of days really live. I don't know, but what is God's will for us that seven days a week, every day, we should come to the end of the day Maybe it wasn't an exciting day or an adventure day, but it's a day when we can put our head on our pillow with satisfaction and say, today, I have lived a day. And I believe by God's grace also we can answer that other question, a way by which we can be saved from the modern idols of society, live in a society that bombards us by advertising hour after hour, day after day, and still realize that we don't satisfy our life with things, but we use things, and we love God, and we love people. When we seek God, He sees that we are fulfilled. When we start seeking good things, we fall short. When God is at home in our hearts, he satisfies our deepest need. Shall we pray? Lord, we covet for our people, covet for our own lives, 
this sense of being at home in you, in your house. We pray that you will help us to build highways in our hearts to you. We invite you to come into every avenue, every area of our life and living, into our thoughts, into our actions, into our relationships, and we seek that you will be at home in us and help us to be at home in you. Lord, we don't seek this just so that we will receive the good things that you promise not to withhold. But we seek you because in you is our only source of real satisfaction. And so, Lord, make us seekers, make us finders, and we'll praise you on the strength of your word. Amen. Number 98, Our Great Savior.
offer you our hearts. They may be your home, your temple. We pray for each home represented here this day. We pray that you will be at home in the places where we live. And we offer you, Lord, our fellowship, our church, this Wollaston Church of the Nazarene, and by grace, those churches that may rep be represented here by visiting friends, we pray that our churches may truly be a place where you're at home too. May we exist for you. May we make it the primary concern of our lives to live in such a way that we're pleasing to you. We pray that you'll be at home in us so that we can be at home in you. Now dismiss us from this place. Go with us, we pray, with a sense of your presence. Watch over us. Make this a day of refreshing to our bodies and our minds. Bring us back again into your house to worship and to praise you. Because we love you. We depend upon you. We thank you for the sweet sense of your presence. Amen.